Shannon Haven, I'm with Data and Society. Dana Boyd, Principal Researcher at Microsoft Research and founder of Data and Society. Stacy Apter, I'm the Director of Operations at Data and Society. Uh, Christelle, I am the Office Admin here at Data and Society. I'm Sorel, I'm an outgoing fellow here. I'm Diana, I'm a fellow here and technologist at Cornell Tech. Uh, I'm Jan, and NYU postdoc. I'm Robin Kaplan, I'm a researcher here at Data and Society and a PhD candidate at Rutgers. Uh, Adam Foreman, uh, Senior Researcher, Center for an Urban Future. I'm Miri Mani, I'm studying data science at Columbia. CJ Brody Landau, Program Administrator here. Italy, Data and Society. All right, we're moving up to the front. I'm doing my Phil Donahue. I love this part. So, all right, wait, who didn't? You. Yeah. I'm Darshna, I'm from the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. Juliet, Civic Hall Labs. Angela, also Civic Hall Labs. Adam Bod, Street Lives NYC. Charlie Chapin, NGA. I'm Julia Fredenberg from the New York City Council. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ackerman from Case Commons. Elizabeth Wissinger, CUNY and Data and Society affiliate. My name is Sonia. I'm a grad student at IT University of Copenhagen. I'm Brianna Vecchioni at the Microsoft Civic Tech Fellow. Hi, I'm Hannah Cutler. I'm studying computer science at Penn and Civic Tech Fellow at Microsoft. I'm Michelle. I'm interning at Google this summer. Nat Poor, independent scholar. Catherine Kramer, New York Hall of Science. Celeste Lecomte, business development at ProPublica. Miguel Paz, a professor at the Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Cool. All right, who, where did this, all right, there we go. Hi, I'm Lee Morganroth. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I founded a site called leemail.me, which does email privacy. Hi, I'm Ava Gannick. I'm a computer science student at Harvard. Charity Kittler, I work at the New York Public Library. Hi, Emily Goldman, Cornell, and um, Beta NYC. Hi, I'm Ann Kidder, and I'm at Sidewalk Labs. Does anybody else want to introduce themselves? Huh? Huh? All right, great. Ooh, wait. No, I feel that you need no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. <laughs> you really know how to pack a room um, full of engaged people. Um, Noel Adago is the executive director of Beta NYC, and he is a 2015-2016 fellow here at Data and Society. Um, today, he's going to recount for us his travels through the lands of smart cities and open data. <laughs> Over the past year of his fellowship, he's going to discuss his work that has been empowering local communities to leverage civic data to improve their local outcomes. He's going to talk about some hard-won lessons that he's learned throughout this collaborations and his partnerships. Many of you, I think, have been his partners this year with New York City's community boards, the mayor's office, Manhattan Borough President, and a few other city agencies I heard. Um, I really think Noel's work is particularly appropriate to round us out here at the end of our fellows year um, because he really his, does his work inside of embedded communities um, and it gives a really unique view of the landscape of data and society that we're trying to trace here. Um, so I think it is going to provide a useful ground for discussion about what's at stake as we're building these systems. So Noel, take it away. Cool. Thank you, Audrey. Um, so yeah, give it a round, for a, a round of applause to Audrey. Let's see if this works. Um, next. Do I have to push this to go next? All right, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to get the emotional part out of the way, so that way uh, I don't cry at the end. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to, uh, I have a few thank yous, uh, and I need to just, in the era that we're living in, uh, head check the privileges that we all have. Um, so it's a extreme privilege to stand in front of you and spend this last year uh, exploring a number of passion projects that I have. Um, and I can't imagine, um, uh, it's just a huge honor to be here. Um, and I know that not everybody has the same opportunity. Um, and I 
think about that every single day. And so first I want to say uh, thank you to my parents and my brother and my godparents and partner. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, without them, they have been my bedrock uh, throughout a lot of my work, and um, my parents in particular, their dedication to service um, and serving in the U.S. Air Force uh, was a, a, a um, they're my heroes. Um, uh, Dana, thank you for uh, taking on this challenge, risk, um, uh, opportunity, giving me this opportunity to, to do this. The staff here at DNS, uh, past and present, I couldn't have done this year without you. Um, and so thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for letting me come in here and be sometimes as bombastic as I have been. Uh, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, um, she is my fairy godmother. Um, I can't, I, this year would not have been possible without her trust and leadership and her passion. Um, Mary McCormick from the Fund for the City of New York uh, for really taking another chance and saying, here's some money to go explore this. John Caney, Andrew Hoppin, Matt Klein, Andrew Roche, and Mika Sifri for being older brothers and allowing me to challenge them in public. Uh, Jen Palka at Code for America and my comrades across the brigade communities. Uh, Beta NYC's leadership team um, that for their trust. That has been uh, an amazing experience to explore over the last year. Uh, the Beta NYC community, uh, the team at Cardo DB and their unflinching support, Santiago, Jeff Frizzoco, uh, Jesse Braden, and Dan Latore, who all came in and helped our fellows this past year, uh, Will Colgrove and Jackie Liu for being partners in arms for some of this exploration. Um, these are city workers who really took a chance uh, to explore some new and vulnerable ideas, and we work through them. Uh, and lastly, the Civic Innovation Fellows, who there is one who's sitting here, um, who really took a chance um, and really uh, didn't know what they were getting into, but they jumped in feet first. And so it's a, it's a huge honor, and I have to first start off by saying thank you uh, to all of them. And I should also say thank you to all of the co-fellows here at DNS uh, who gave me advice when I needed it. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, today we're going to go on a journey through space and time. We're going to start with the Lenape people and the European settlement where we are at. We're going to journey and stand with the suffragettes. We're going to marshal on uh, through the New Deal and the adaptations of the Grand American Experiment. I'm going to introduce you to the most important newspaper you've never heard about. I will introduce you to some of New York City's future leaders. We'll attend a birthday party. We're going to hang out with a bunch of tree nerds. Uh, and then we're going to end at the foot of a bridge, which is really the beginning of the unknown. Uh, and let me tell you, everything that I'm about to talk about is worth fighting for. So our journey starts off here in Manhattan. We are on the island of Manahatta. This means the island of many hills. We start this discussion uh, knowing and we should recognize the, the Lenape people who were the first known people on this island. Um, their understanding of like social power is really um, should be seen as kind of like the foundation of where, where we came. When the Dutch arrived, the Dutch were welcomed on, on this island. They were seen as, as, as compatriots, as, as an opportunity to share land and resources. They welcomed the European settler, settlers and were happy to collaborate with them. The Dutch were more than happy to do this because this was the first New World colony that was founded for commerce and not under a religious charter. And so our shared sense of existence and mercantilism is the city's bedrock. Some other unique things that you should know about New York City's history is that, uh, according to the island of the center of the world, America's Bill of Rights grows from the soil that we, uh, that we get to touch. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press can all be traced back to the Dutch Republic. That was the government uh, that oversaw the New Amsterdam. Um, our Third Amendment grew from the Spanish Catholics commandeering Dutch homes. And so when we think about our liberties, they're really rooted here uh, in, in, in the islands that we get to inhabit and, and play around and visit. Um, and this is really a history of uh, uh, people-powered government. Uh, you can look at the history books of, of the new Amsterdam settlement, and they were always clamoring and demanding the people's right to be represented within government. And, you know, 
several hundred years later, we get to the progressive movement. We're on 20th Street, which is quite marvelous. I've, uh, every day when I park my scooter on the further west side or east side, I get to walk by Teddy Roosevelt's birthplace, which is here on 20th Street. And it's an elegant reminder of kind of like where we have come through our politics. Uh, the progressive mo uh, movement 100 years ago with Al Smith and uh, the, um, the Roosevelt's, plural, FDR, Eleanor, and uh, Theo, uh, were all about understanding how uh, government can serve the people better. Uh, they fought for federal income tax, direct election of uh, federal senators, prohibition, how well that went. Uh, other cool things like women's suffrage, which we can celebrate today, an amazing achievement by uh, Hillary Clinton and finally cracking that ceiling. The term muckrockers were, were coined during this time period. They were modernizers who believed in science and technology. You know, they wanted to understand how the tools of their time could improve people's lives, whether it was rural, municipal, whether they were former slaves, women who had been disenfranchised, and they were also fans of organic food. Um, they believed in strong government regulation, uh, and they believed in strong uh, labor unions. Sadly, there were also a few progressives who believed in eugenics and limiting immigration. And sadly, during the FDR administration, there was internment camps for people who, um, uh, there were internment camps for Americans uh, prisoned on our soil because they looked different. Now, this is, this is our history of pro progressive movement, and it, and it kind of frames where we are really in the 21st century. I can't use that arrow. So uh, out of this came a number of strong allies here in New York City. The League of Women Voters are the direct descendants of the suffragette movement. Citizens Union fought and said, we need government transparency and government information. Citizens Union is also key to the most important newspaper you've never heard of. Well, some of you have because you work for government. Um, Common Cause, NYPIRG, the Civil Liberties Union, these are all outgrowths of the progressive movement that came here from New York City. New York City is also blessed with amazing academic organizations like uh, data and Society, GovLab, and CUSP, who are trying to understand and embrace this modern idea of using technology and tools to improve everyone's lives. So New York City's government structure is really, really unique. We have a really strong mayor. We have an immense amount of resources underneath uh, or at our disposal. We have great teams here in New York City government, like New York City 311, Do It, Moda, and Moti, that are here represented. We have a really amazing city council and a really, at this particular time period, a really amazing speaker um, who wants to figure out how to bridge this digital divide. We have amazing and thoughtful borough presidents. Uh, I may criticize them about the policies that they try to implement, but I really admire the type of leadership that New York City has been developing for the last few hundred years. The scale of New York City is overwhelming, and just to kind of ground this uh, uh, for you to understand, 51% of New York City's live, 51% of the city lives in or near poverty. That's six million people. 1.1 million kids are in New York City schools. If that was a city, it would be the 10th largest city in America. Close to half a million people live in our public housing, which is the equivalent of the city of Atlanta. 700,000 people come in and out of Grand Central on a daily basis. That's more than the city of Boston. There are 18,000 miles of pavement and sidewalk. If you don't know how far that is, that is between here, going to Hawaii, coming back, going back to Hawaii, and then ending up in San Francisco. All of that is maintained by our tax dollars here in New York City. We have amazing history of, uh, not only do we have advocacy groups, but we also have community groups like Gizmo. I was honored to have one of my local heroes, uh, Alan Leiter, come and do a data bite. You should watch his video. Uh, he talks about how uh, September 11th and Sandy are really seminal moments in the open data movement here in New York City. But Gizmo paved the way for early data sharing policies and tools to be adopted. If you've ever used Lion or if you've ever used Pluto, um, they come from the early work that, uh, that Gizmo and those uh, advocates were doing as, as a community group. 
People have been passionate about local democracy, and so since the 1950s, we've had these community uh, uh, land use groups. Um, they are now known as community boards. Uh, they were reorganized in the 90s, and they better represent, to better represent community needs, and their responsibilities uh, oversee 150 to 200,000 New Yorkers, and they have three charter-mandated responsibilities. One, look at uh, and oversee land use and zoning. Two is understand uh, community needs. And three is to see how government services are delivered in New York and kind of advise on the, the, the calculation of that. Um, they are, if, how many of you have used 311? Raise your hand. Okay, good number of you. They're the original 311. Uh, if you had a problem and you didn't know where to go, you would go to your community board and the community board would address it. They are the local troubleshooters. If you have an issue that's between multiple agencies, community boards were designed as, a, as along with uh, city council members to solve your problem. You don't have to be a citizen to be on a community board. You don't need to be a resident to be on a community board. You just need to have business in that district to be a part of this volunteer government. Some of our great leadership uh, led to um, the very first municipal data directory. Um, this is a data catalog. It is a physical data catalog. And in 1993, it was published with a complete listing of all of the data sets that the city had access to that you could use the Freedom of Information Act or law to, to, to see what was going on within government. 1993, imagine what technology, I mean, how many of you were uh, using technology in 1993? Yeah, so how many of you had memory tapes and using on your Atari? Yeah, a few of us, all right. Um, well, those, those were the things that you could get access to. Um, this has led uh, to a, a seminal open data law that was passed in um, 2012. It took us a while to get to this particular law, and since then we've been able to strengthen it, but the New York City's uh, open data law is the best. Uh, it there are over 13,000 municipal data sets that you have access to. Uh, it is, I think, considered the largest municipal data set in the United, or municipal data portal in the United States. Uh, Albert can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, we are the best and we are the largest. We're the greatest. Um, just to give you a picture of like how big this is, we're talking about New York City just for one year alone. New York City's yellow cab trip data has over 70 million records. So for those of you who like large data sets, I'm gonna tell you, that's just one year alone. Uh, New York City's 311 service inquiry data, which is essentially every time that you've picked up the telephone and called 311, there are 56 million records that you have access to. Uh, the New York City 311 service request data, which is essentially a compilation of all of the 311 service requests, whether it's through mobile, phone, Twitter, Skype, you name it, there are 13 million records alone that date back to 2010. So when we're talking about big data, kind of like within the context of municipal government, I love this stuff. So for me, the ultimate question is, what does a 21st century New York City government look like? And Ultimately, how is it for and by the people of New York? We learned a huge lesson uh, at the beginning part, uh, let's see, 2014, I believe. We're in 2016 now, so it'd be 2014, 2015. I will call this the huge lesson learned. Uh, and this is the most important newspaper that you have never heard about. So now let me ask you, how many of you have heard about the New York City uh, City Record? How many, how many put those hands up there? That's okay, all right, maybe about a third, a quarter. Cool, um, and I know all of you. Um, so the New York City, uh, uh, rec <laughs> this is hard to say, the NYC City record uh, started out of the progressive movement. It was the, using 20th century technology to inform the public of what's going on within cities. So you can get the, the city record, it's published every single business day, and it informs and tells you what meetings are happening, what procurement decisions are happening, uh, salaries, who's getting hired, who's getting fired, what their, what their pay rate is, um, kind of like what's the status of procurement decisions, so they're announcing it, who's bidding on it, and ultimately who wins. I mean, this is the city's change log, and for uh, 
over 100 years, maybe close to like 100, and, yeah, about 100 years, it was in paper format and only available in paper format. Uh, in, um, within the last 10 years, uh, it was published as a PDF. Uh, and then it was published online, available as a PDF, so you still had to subscribe to this, and you had to pay money to get access to what's going on within the city. But eventually, uh, we passed a law um, that got the city record online that was to essentially get all of this data. The law is very simple. It says, put all this data in machine-readable format. And we were honored to uh, join with Council Member Kalos, and he drafted the legislation, council reviewed it, they put it through, they passed it. Um, and we had one year to essentially turn this data or turn this information into structured data. And we had grand designs. The Beta NYC community and a number of other were really, really excited that we were gonna take the most important newspaper that you've never heard of and put it online and machine structured data. Until we find out that the people who are actually publishing it don't feel that they have a responsibility to know what's going on within the city record. They essentially update a number, or they have a bunch of forms that they control that have free text fields, and they allow the city to essentially report all this information into the city record, and then it goes through your traditional uh, workflow and gets published as a newspaper. So this is, oh, I can't use the arrows. So this is what it looks like. This is, this is the most important information that you've never heard of. And it comes right now, this is a screen capture from this morning, with HTML tags. And, uh, um, and this is the data that we spent a year trying to build libraries to scrape and ongoing conversations of trying to understand how to get it into a useful structured format. Um, I have feelings that probably shouldn't be said in public about this process, uh, but what I learned um, is that um, we needed to really think through the whole data collection, processing, and sharing process. Um, out of this particular uh, uh, attempt of making structured data, uh, we got two other pieces of legislation passed. One was called Geodata Standards um, that gives structured data that, that actually says that the city has to sit down and talk with itself about what data standards, uh, uh, geolocation data uh, should be shared. How should it be shared? Um, for those of you who don't know, that's like making sure that the number is separate from the street, that the apartment number has its own little column. You know, like if there's a, all of that little minutia needs to be spelled out and there needs to be a collective practice around that. Second is that every data set should come with a manual. We're getting all of this data. We're advocating for all this data, but how do we actually know what's in this data? I mean, people were revert, have been reverse engineering this data for a long, long time. If you read uh, Ben Wellington's I Quant New York, that's what he loves to do. He loves to sit there with Excel spreadsheets and do pivot tables until he learns what's in the data, and then he tells you a very interesting story. It shouldn't be just for quants. It should be accessible to everybody. So with all of these lessons learned, how does an idealist outsider with no money uh, and an army of 2,000 avid civic hackers actually make a difference in the city? So you're gonna, now you're gonna get some of the Lord of the Rings animated GIFs. Um, so we start off with baby steps. Uh, first thing I did is that I outlined a basic vision of what needed to be uh, of open data, uh, started applying for programs that would provide for a home and runway to extend these ideas, and started recruiting partners to do crazy things. Do It, New York City 311, uh, Borough President's Office, all of them joined up with trust, which was kind of amazing. Uh, at Pratt, I had an opportunity to actually iron out the first rung of the ladder, and this would be an introductory open data class with a focus on New York City 311 and the city's open data portal. Here at DNS, I would measure out the second, third, and fourth rungs of the ladder, hopefully uh, expanding on these ideas into open data trainings with community boards and city council staff, and with one of my tr most trusted allies, Manhattan Borough President's Office, uh, I would partner with one of her senior policy advisors, Will Colgrove, who was also a friend, uh, and together we would redesign an under, undergraduate fellowship program. 
so just to give you a little bit of understanding of like where this foundation uh, starts off with, so at Pratt, um, Pratt Institute, there's this really cool program called Savvy, which if you're ever looking for a geospatial certificate, you should go and uh, uh, look at Savvy's program, and they will teach you essentially the whole narrative arc and all the tools on how to become a, uh, a cartographer, a 21st century cartographer. So a few civic hackers were recruited to essentially uh, start ir ironing out classes for the certification program. I joined with Nathan Story, and we developed an introduction to New York City 311. Our goals were very simple. We wanted to lay out a framework for investigating data, building data dictionaries, uh, develop an understanding, and essentially developing an understanding around primary keys within the data, because we needed to pull out and learn. Once we had the data, we needed to learn from what was inside of the data. Uh, we wanted to learn how to actually explore the data through the Socrata data platform, which itself um, is a, at times can be confusing, um, but you know, like any other operating system, once you learn how to get it, you seem to understand it. And then fundamentally, uh, do basic data storytelling. And then ultimately provide all this feedback to our friends in government. So while I was working on that program, Gail was working on another program. They were recruiting CUNY Service Corps, so CUNY, thank you. Um, and CUNY Service Corps are undergraduate students who say that they're going to work 12 hours a week. Um, uh, they're going to get paid, uh, pay your interns. Um, and ultimately, they're going to work for some type of community group. Um, and so Gail had recruited this diverse group of people. Uh, there were a number of classes. And the insights that came out of that were, we need more structure, and we need a partner to do that. So enter the Civic Innovation Fellows Program. This was a, uh, it was and is, hopefully, with Lucian in the back, uh, will be a uh, ongoing three-phase program uh, based off of a civic tech curriculum. Um, and the, the curriculum and the program kind of work hand in hand with each other. One is that it teaches CUNY students or undergraduate students how to become civic technologists or at least understand the basics of civic technology. And the second part is have them do something useful. Right, that can't be more important. We don't want to waste uh, six months or really three months of their time. And uh, then ultimately, this is going to go through an agile loop. So we sit there and we refine the whole process and write up the insights. Um, this year, the cool thing that, or the useful thing that the CUNY students did, is that they provided and performed the first comprehensive review of community board operations. Um, so let's see here. Do I have everything else? Um, as part of this process, students learned kind of what is a 311 service request. Um, they were able to understand what are the hot spots. How do you develop an understanding of municipal data? Why do people call 311? And ultimately, what are the biases that are represented within any municipal data set? New York City 311, if you're ever interested in understanding kind of biases within data or municipal actions, uh, New York City 311 data set is the best data set to start this process. Um, now, there are a couple of things that we wanted to learn. And what are we at? I'm uh, OK, cool. Um, so the boot camp and execution took uh, a lot longer due to a, a number of issues. So uh, if you are like Will and I, and never really worked with undergraduate students um, uh, in this particular vein. Uh, students had a variety of backgrounds, and so we needed to figure out how to ultimately embrace pair programming. Um, so uh, we're looking at their schedule, we broke the students up into three teams, um, roughly around three or four students per team, um, and then we're able to manage the education process through that. Um, the students had a variety of schedules. Um, sometimes were completely inconsistent, um, and this became a uh, something that we needed to figure out, like how to essentially do send send the students home with homework that they could then work on these different programs. Uh, another thing is undergraduate students right now don't have uniform hardware. Some of them were using tablets. Some of them were using Microsoft Surface. Some of them were using you know very advanced. Um, uh, Windows machines and, and advanced Macs, and trying to find one core set of technologies that would work for all of them um, became a headache. Um, 
we also, when you're dealing with undergraduate students you, and you're expecting to put them out in the public's eye, um, you really need to understand and examine their competency. No offense, Shalom. Uh, but like, it, you know, when we are young adults, we don't necessarily always know what questions to ask and how to react in professional environments. And so this was through this boot camp process, we were able to churn through and kind of structure interactions so that we, we can actually test and see who were the high performers, who were the ones who really understood, uh, like, who understood what were the right things to do, and then coach the students who didn't quite understand that to, to understand what are the better decisions that they should be making. To be frank, we were doing something new and really didn't know how long it would take, and frankly, that's kind of what we found our situation in. Um, we originally started six weeks, and it ended up being 12 weeks. To graduate, students had to present uh, into, uh, uh, in front of an audience of practitioners. They did that here at Data and Society, um, and that was one of the first nerve-wracking challenges that they had. Um, we then had them present to 50 strangers at New York City School of Data. We then made sure that the borough president had an opportunity to sit down um, uh, with all of the borough service cabinet, which is essentially all of the community board leaders and leaders from different agencies that show up to represent official representation of like what's going on within the city and the students had to sit there um, and, and, and present uh, in front of them. Uh, and then finally, as the cherry on top of everything, uh, they had to present in front of CUNY chancellors uh, their insights. And so we really, really turned these students into professional speakers, or at least that's what we feel. And that set the foundation for uh, the next phase of the project, which was the field research. So evaluating the students with limited hardware and their limited technological skills, we needed to develop some type of program that um, would make them do something useful. Um, and we couldn't have them build websites or develop software applications. So, um, and Will and I were also in a situation where we needed to do a bunch of research about community boards and community boards' needs. So if you think about the agile uh, loop process, you're developing assumptions. Well, we had no real clear of assumptions of what were going on, what was going on within community boards. And we didn't want to be in a position where we go around and we send undergraduate students to teach community boards how to use data to technology without necessarily knowing exactly what was in community boards. Uh, so um, we said, let's go out and have the students do this research. Uh, and do the research that we, we wish we had the time to do. So ultimately, the students were organized uh, to examine community board operations. What technology do they use? How do they use data? And how is social media and websites working for them? With the nine of the 11 students that we started with, uh, we graduated nine of them, we organized them into three teams and then organized those three teams. Uh, so there were three students for every team of three. No, three students within teams of three. No, how do I say this? Uh, there were three in one, and then there were one of three. No, okay. Um, so then we turned them around, and we had them visit every single Manhattan community board, uh, and they compiled 48 hours of detailed interviews, and what they discovered blew our mind. Um, so this is kind of like the unvarnished part, so if you're a reporter, please don't quote every single word on this. Um, but what we discovered is that Manhattan community boards um, say that they are understaffed, and in many ways they're under-equipped to deal with 21st century technology uh, practices. Um, the, through these interviews, they expressed a strong desire for uh, digital literacy training, um, tools, and technology. Community boards currently don't have a contact relationship management system, so even if you uh, have a problem between two different agencies and you need to go to a community board to have that problem solved, they really don't have an actual uh, case management software. Um, the do it provided websites that are out there are time consuming and frustrating to maintain. They can't embed third-party content, uh, nor is it easy to edit because there's a lot of hand coding of HTML. Office internet speeds averaged around 10 megabits per second. I mean, imagine that, 10 megabits per second in an office of about five people. How do you feel about that? 
no one? If everybody's like sweating um, here, it's, it is hot. Sorry about that. Um, much of the city's open data program is confusing and time consuming for these people to, to, uh, to work with. Uh, and frankly, you know, there was a time period where they used to get reports from 311, but because of the 311, uh, or because of the data advocacy that we've done, and 311 data is now available for them to essentially crunch the numbers themselves, the reports disappeared. So because of our open data advocacy, the usefulness uh, that they had of these reports is now missing, and so now they want to figure out how to get the reports back again, and there's this whole kind of like, what type of cycle or what type of tool do we develop that essentially does better through one reports to these community boards. The interesting part, this is uh, the graduating class here at Data and Society up against this wall. Um, and the interesting twist of fate is that city council off offices that we've interviewed also experience the exact same problem. There's a, a lack of uh, digital literacy across community or uh, across city council offices. There's a strong desire for trainings in a wide range, on a wide range of tools and technologies. They want better relationship management uh, software. Their internet speeds. They all want faster internet. You can never have fast enough internet apparently. Uh, much of the city's data is confusing and time consuming to work with, and they too want better through one reports. So here we have two branches of New York City government, the ones that are in charge of hearing the people's voices, and they feel that they're not equipped to engage in the 21st century with 21st century tools. So in this year of exploration, we wanted to test out and do a number of other interventions. So uh, how many of you attended School of Data? This is just... It was a really busy day. Okay, maybe about an eighth of you. Thanks for coming next year uh, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the city's open data law. Put it on your calendar sometime in the beginning of March, uh, NYC School of Data. And so uh, NYC School of Data was a way to celebrate the city's open data law. It was a way to kind of like see what the ecosystem looked like. Uh, the, it was a collaborative network improving the city's data ecosystem, or at least that's what we branded it as. Uh, this was a network to enrich our lives and communities through technology, data, and design. Um, so this year we invited civic hackers and community-based organizations to learn from each other and uh, see how we can improve our communities and our data. So the event featured, um, yeah, hopefully next year you'll all be able to wear party hats. Um, so the event uh, featured the city council speaker, uh, Manhattan Borough President, uh, CTO Tantoco, council member Ben Kalos, uh, Jen Palka from Code for America, and a dozen or so other city agencies coming out and more or less representing the data that they had. And it was an opportunity for people to actually meet with the data producers. Um, so we had 18 sessions, 40 presenters. Um, we offered childcare, so that way people could come who were parents, which was a really, um, it wasn't a novel thing, but it's now something that we have reviewed within our whole practice of producing events, and we're gonna make sure that if we do something on the weekend, we're always gonna do something with childcare. We educated and taught eight high schoolers how to navigate the city's open data law and manipulate the 301 data. Uh, one family attended representing three generations. We had a grandmother who was an organizer and data visualizer. We had a father who was a data advocate and a daughter who was an aspiring civic hacker. Um, uh, and then, let's see here. So what we learned was within four years, New York City's open data and open technology systems are critical components to our broader municipal tech ecosystem. There is a huge desire to understand New York City's open data. Um, and the desire is as much inside of government as it is outside of government. And in general, people are desperate to have real engagement with data owners, producers, and maintainers. Uh, and ultimately, they want to understand how they can have agency to help produce and fix the problems that they see within the data. They see a problem, they want to make sure that they can share that information out to the general public and ultimately, hopefully, correct those problems. So another intervention that we had an opportunity to play around with, this is actually a photo of us the year beforehand, so this is a year before uh, celebrating the creation of a data set. So this is 2015. Um, we went out as part of the Trees Count, which was a, uh, uh, the third decennial tree census. These are the tree fairies that I spoke about. Uh, yay, tree fairies. Um, 
so uh, for uh, we went out and measured street trees. This is uh, something that is done every 10 years. This is the third decennial uh, tree census. Uh, we were using open source tools uh, to create the um, um, one of the city's largest data sets. Um, there were 2,300 volunteers that went from street tree to street tree marking down its species, uh, its diameter, where it existed on the sidewalk. And this uh, whole program was dependent upon volunteers and community-based organizations to understand what this data set is, the, the, the street trees. So um, the city was forced, more or less because of the scale of this program, they were forced to trust the, the volunteers. Uh, and then they built a whole back-end workflow that allowed for the city to clean up the data um, and create it in that process have now created a new digital civic engagement tool which will allow you if you see a tree in front of your house and you want to take care of it you're a tree steward um, and now there's going to be a website that you can go to launched in in September where you can actually get credits uh, for well social credits um, for watering and maintaining that tree so through this process, in 2015, New York City's parks wanted to actively engage those users who were make, making the data uh, and were asking them, uh, if you had the data, what would you do with it? Um, if, what were the questions that you would have from that? And so that built the foundation for uh, what we did this year as the Trees Count Data Jam. Excuse me for a second. The goal was to have the public transform the data gathered so far into actionable insights. This program was then broken down into three phases. So uh, we had a planning phase, we essentially hosted this event, and then we did a debriefing. We had close to 200 people attend the Trees Count Data Jam, and they tackled five questions. How has the urban forest changed? How can we vi visualize street tree census data to improve our understanding of the urban forest and educate fellow New Yorkers about that change? What are the relationships that can be drawn between street trees, data, and other environmental or economic indicators? Uh, and ultimately, how can we use the tree census data to more effectively plan for long-term health growth of the urban forest? And how can the street trees census data be used to engage and target the efforts of community stewardship volunteers to improve the health of urban forests. So uh, that means I'm running out of time. Um, so the park's goal was to really have the civic engagement uh, event that pushed the data out to the general public, that taught the general public how to use this data. Um, and, and throughout this process, I had a number of gears that were running in the back of my head, working from School of Data, the Civic Innovation Fellows, and particularly the process that we had gone through with the um, city record. Here you have another citywide data set that's gonna be very, very technical with all of this very detailed minutia, species, diameter, uh, location. So how do we turn that data into human readable data? So first, we wanted to make sure that that data was legible, and, and it worked within the context of the city's data sharing platform, which is the Socrata data platform. Um, so we made sure that it was actually human readable. If you go to the street tree census data right now, you do not need the data dictionary to read that data. Uh, the second thing that we wanted to do, and I have to thank uh, Julia, who is part of this team, um, we coined this notion of human-centered data release, um, which itself takes from the um, human-centered design practices, which is broken down into three different phases. So there's the research and discovery phase. So we iron out targets, audiences that we want to play around with the data. We draft data standards that appeal to the broadest data audience, and then we draft a data dictionary. And this is then, we move into a user testing phase, more or less our beta phase. We develop sample releases for feedback. We gather and do user testing to understand how 
data users could take that data and answer different questions. Ultimately, we develop a, a framework and or a guide to explore the data set's most important values. Uh, and then we allow for revisions so that way the data process itself can be improved. Uh, and then we go to phase three, the initial deployment, where we upload the data um, and the data dictionary to the municipal data portal. And then we host a big event or a, a video kind of explaining the key features of the data. And then we allow for more time and feedback to come into the ecosystem and ultimately, hopefully, improve that process. And from these insights and doing this particular program, we actually got to work with New York City 311 to do the service inquiry data, that one of, of how many million records? F 56 million uh, records. So we were partnered with 311 to host an event at Civic Hall that essentially started this process. And you know, in the big narrative arc, that is one thing that we want to see this city do for all of its future data releases. In the broadest sense of the things that we've been learning, I have a whole outline, and I'm not sure I really, do I have enough time to go through? I have 30 minutes, right? All right. How many of you are sweating or is it just me? <laughs> Okay, um, so, um, uh, what is it, August 20th, I think is, is Joe Strummer's birthday, um, so um, he was, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so the future is unwritten. Obviously, uh, something can happen tomorrow and drastically change municipal data policies um, and kind of erase all of the hard wins that we've had for many, many years. We actually experienced that already with Sandy. The city had passed the open data law. We were on a roadmap and a, roadmap and a trajectory to have a number of data sets released. Sandy happened and delayed us, delayed that roadmap effectively for like about a year. So something to be considering is that technology moves uh, at times within uh, pivots of crisis. September 11th uh, is a really important um, lesson to learn, and I want to go back to, to um, Alan Leiter's uh, presentation, within that crucible, that moment, that crucible of uh, Lower Manhattan being destroyed, uh, they gathered together hard drives that they had from various locations and started networking together their computers that they had at home or in other spare locations and started fusing data together. That brought a larger picture of how to bring all these different data sets together, ultimately creating the backbone of what we now know as Lion. So a moment of, a moment of municipal crisis can either accelerate or decelerate everything that we think about when it comes down to technology. That in mind, there are four things that we hope to see uh, developed. Uh, well, I'm going to rephrase this. There are four things I hope to see developed. I'm not going to speak for anybody else other than what I found in this. There's trainings, policy, tools and technology, and infrastructure. Um, there is a huge need, as we hear in a number of different components, is for ongoing digital literacy programs. Uh, whether it's in the public, so that way people are armed and ready to join the 21st century workforce, or whether it's people who are already in the workforce needing to improve their professional skills. Uh, government needs it just as much as the private sector, um, p potentially even more so, so that way they can figure out how to become more efficient. Uh, there is an explicit need for digital media and data literacy trainings within government, uh, something that I would have never thought of, but public facilitation and uh, engagement and organizing is a competency that um, is called for time and time again, and it is something that is acquired, seemingly, uh, through political activity or community activity, and it isn't necessarily a trait that is actively taught within um, uh, you know, technology skills. And that's a fundamental component so that way when a technologist needs to present or do user testing, they have the opportunity to go out and actually do engagement. 
Uh, implicit bias training seemingly uh, can cut across every single element uh, of uh, our operations. Um, agile software development training in the sense that uh, ticket tracking. How many of you use collaborative ticket tracking uh, tools? Um, <laughs> How many of you would like to use collaborative ticket tracking tools with your coworkers? Okay, uh, and then how many of you are asleep? <laughs> okay, um, uh, that to me it seems like the, some of these problems that teams are working on um, these are these are practices that 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 type of training needs to happen within the public. There's a um, uh, an obvious need for some type of civics training. How many of you are native New Yorkers and know exactly how New York City government's organized? Okay. How many of you would like to know how New York City's government is organized so that way you can affect a change? Exactly. Um, so, you know, like I, I know that some of uh, uh, one person in the audience out here is, is looking at doing a civic hacking training at a general assembly, like, uh, you know, broader civics courses. Um, also, evangelizing open data um, by developing classes and workshops that interface directly with community based organizations and neighborhood based organizations. Uh, if we move around the city, and have are forced to deal with this really cyclical, um, maybe at times violent economic development market, uh, and we're gentrified out of the places that we live, we really need to know who are our neighbors and who are our allies, and so how can we use our technical skills um, to help them? And so one thing that I'd like to see is um, greater training that brings people together around that. In regards to policy, uh, this has been a very interesting uh, uh, administration to kind of examine uh, for the sense that there has been, um, Bloomberg saw the civil service program as something that just got in the way of him hiring smart and effective people. This administration, the de Blasio administration says there's value within the civil service program. That being said, I have friends who have done their job under the de Blasio administration, or the Bloomberg administration, and essentially under the de Blasio administration were in a situation where they lost their job because they didn't take the civil service test when it was last offered, so they're no longer on the schedule to actually be in the position that they're at, so then they have to leave the job that they've been doing for the last year moving forward. They've, they did this job for a year, and now they have to hire a replacement from someone who's on a list. I'm not saying that the civil service program is bad. I'm saying that, in, that there are opportunities to modernize that. There's definitely, if the city is going to be adopting uh, and demanding that technologists are on these schedules, those tests need to be offered more often. And there also needs to be a whole suite of online test prep programs. So if you do want to go work inside of the city and make change happen, you shouldn't have to see that civil service exam and that opportunity uh, as a barrier. Um, I'm really excited to see how Doit does a lot of insourcing software development. Uh, but in that notion of insourcing software development, there also needs to be a culture of prototyping and, and a culture of experimentation. Um, we're starting to see some of that happen in different elements and pockets within the city and give a lot of praise to the um, uh, um, digital uh, guidelines as well as uh, the Internet of Things guidelines as opportunities to, um, to frame. Here is a little sandbox for you to play around with. Um, modernizing procurement policies that promote prototyping and experimentation is, a, is another policy change. Um, open conversations that really build on human-centered data practices as well as design practices. Doit has a whole human-centered uh, design program that they're developing internally, and I would just wish that I could hear more about how that's operating. operating. Um, structured services around communities' needs rather than by agencies' needs is one of those explicit digital playbook uh, uh, statements that the city put out. Um, and um, I think that in the 21st century, whether it's a community board, city council, you name it, where, wherever it is within our structure, that's one of those inherent values that should come out. When it comes down to technology and tools, there's a lot of 
I forget what the city's budget around IT procurement is, but it is big. Dominic, do you, do you, do you have an exact number of how, how much the city, how, how much does the city pay for in IT? Okay. Um, sorry to put you on the spot on that one. Um, but, uh, um, I mean, it's billions of dollars. If you think about like any other business that's out there, uh, Bradley, do you, do you have that number? Uh, no, okay. Um, I, if we have a city that is, what's the city budget though? I'm trying to get a hard number here. $80 billion is the city's budget. Uh, and you think about how much of that probably involves some type of technology. Um, what would happen if just a portion of that was focused on open source? What type of benefits would happen when IT procurement systems did improve the open technology that was out there? Imagine smaller cities and what type of benefit would happen with smaller cities being able to use the exact same software that a large city like New York has. Um, ultimately, cycling through all of the procurement contracts that enable for systems that are more API-based. Uh, I've been told that there are systems that were implemented under the last administration that don't have read-write APIs, and it's kind of like amazing to think about that there was technology tool that was implemented within the last 10 years that was, doesn't have the, uh, a permissible API uh, to write into any one of these database um, tools. Lastly, when it comes down to infrastructure and Internet of Things, I would love to see a municipally owned wireless mesh network that enshrines privacy. Um, uh, I like Link NYC. I'm also scared of Link NYC. Um, I want tools that protect my anonymity, uh, particularly if they're offered ubiquitous, ubiquitously. Uh, I would love to see cross-agency data systems that ensure user privacy. Uh, I've been told that, that we are working toward that direction and I'm, I look forward to seeing those large data systems. Um, when it comes down to the, the last two things are the Internet of Things around uh, the projects our guidelines, the city released a bunch of guidelines that are absent of um, consent. They say that you need to inform the communities when you produce IoT-based things, but ultimately you're just telling them we're going to be doing surveillance. Um, and it would be great if communities can actually say, well, I have questions about that. Please don't do that. That means my time is up. Um, the last thing that I would like to think about in the future of the Internet of Things, particularly here in New York City, and we've seen them in a few different programs, is that, that they build local opportunity. So um, uh, Red Hook Wireless is a great example. Rise NYC's program that's going to be pushed out throughout the city uh, is the fact that when you're building this infrastructure that you give opportunity to the people that are in the neighborhoods to learn the skills and the competencies so that way they can join the 21st century workforce. Um, with an $80 billion budget, it seems that there's workforce development opportunities that the city's working on. And how do we move into the 21st century that builds uh, opportunities for everyone? And so with that, the future really is unwritten. This is kind of a loose collection of ideas that, that I'm gonna be working on. Um, I look forward to working uh, with these other programs, with the other municipal partners, Manhattan Borough President, to develop the next iteration of the Civic Innovation Fellows. Um, I look forward, if you're a city agency that's out there and you want to explore a large-scale data release, we have some ideas around that. Um, and we look forward to joining arms with Do It and Moda and working forward and kind of like paving the future. So thank you for coming out. And now we're going to take some questions, I guess. Yeah. Questions? 
Yeah, um, I'm a teacher as well, so I was thinking about what you were saying about the schedules. Um, how were you able to, to work with the students to actually, first and foremost, do not overpromise things that they could not deliver with the community, which is always a risk? And on the other side, um, how many other classes did they have to, to get a sense of um, how much time they were putting into this and the, if they were able to do the, job, the work? So, uh, Shalom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the students all had to have a full, like they needed to be a full-time student, and so they needed to have a full course load. Um, and then this was a program that was designed, the Service Corps program is uh, designed for the, that they apply to, um, and then they get accepted, and then they have to choose kind of a, 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 um, um, a placement. Um, and so they go around and interview, and so there's kind of like a double selection process. They select a place, and the uh, location also selects them. Um, so they had a full uh, uh, course load. Um, and how did we manage um, overpromising? Um, that was just kind of like something that Will and I um, had to manage with community boards. We had grand designs. I think we may have overpromised in our initial idea without really understanding that the students, um, their capacity. And so by the end of the program, we realized that we just kind of brought things down a little bit. Um, and we asked the students to do the same thing too. Don't make any commitments. You're going out and doing research. That's a challenge that we're going to face next year when we uh, explore how students actually develop technology or make changes. We need to figure out how to manage that type of, that is the challenge that we're going to have to manage next year. So I'm wondering if you could say a bit about the gap between regular users, council, community board users, and the open data that the city puts out, which is something you've clearly seen people's ability to use that data or to, to use it in a practical way. Who do you see appropriately filling that gap? Is that a market opportunity, which I feel like a lot of people are pushing toward? This is a new field. There's all this money. People should build apps and get the data and present it. Do you think that's a government responsibility? Is it civic hackers working for free, or where do you, what have you seen in terms of filling that space that you think is useful for us to hear about? So the the usefulness um, starts with the, just the the data utility as being um, as uh, as as being a, a resource um, to build on top of, um, and so maturing the data release program so that way data is released with standards in mind and quality data um, um, helps us then move to the next step, which would hopefully take the market and the market would solve for a number of types of solutions. So 3-in-1 data is eloquently used in um, some real estate uh, apartment hunting websites now, where you can uh, you can go to a building and you can see uh, what are the 311 complaints that surround that. There's been a few that have worked to get Department of Buildings data, but they've had to either scrape, foil, or um, come pay for access to Department of Buildings data, so that way that you can see the problems. So there's, there are market solutions. There are volunteer-based solutions that kind of do the, or, or prototype solutions. But then there needs to be, in the context of like government information, there should be a role for government to play to build tools, ideally, that focus on internal needs, whether it's interagency, council, community board. Like those types of platforms, that, Somebody should be developing those types of services, and I'm not sure that the private sector market is ultimately going to solve for that because that's an internal government need. Maybe they can help create it through a contract, but there is a role for government to be producing those types of tools. NYC, uh, what is it, Building Atlas? No, is it, is it Building Atlas or Data Atlas? Like where you can see where um, economic... Uh, I wish Moda was here, or if anybody. 
Small Business Atlas, um, where if you're a small business owner, you can actually look at the uh, economic conditions of a neighborhood and then take that to a bank and say, look, my neighborhood is improving or there is an economic opportunity here. This is government information. Give me a loan or help me work through the development of some type of uh, economic opportunity so that way I, as a small business, can help grow that business. Um, so I think it's all three. Hi, so you started to talk just now about real estate, and my question was about housing, because of course it's a huge problem in New York City, displacement, gentrification, landlord harassment, uh, disrepair of housing stock, and so a lot of that is on the city level and you know through HPD. Some of it is on the state level, DHCR, which isn't subject to um, you know, the city's open data law. But so I just wondered, because you went into detail in your presentation about the street tree database and kind of how that, you know, translates into actual on the ground change. So could you talk more about in the area of housing and tenants, what you see as the hope for change with these technological tools? So thanks for bringing up the state, because they should also, um, government data, pra data release practice should be inclusive. Um, if we go back to, I'm just going to go back to, to my notes here, where it is structure services around New Yorkers' needs rather than by agency needs. I mean, fundamentally, if you have federal, state, and local programs that are uh, impacting the citizen, there should be some type of collaborative loop to get that information and data in a way that ultimately benefits the the um, constituent. So in regards to housing, a lot of the housing programs, and we, we did an event at Civic Hall, um, we as in Beta NYC did an event at Civic Hall talking about affordable housing data. Um, and Emily, who's over here, hi Emily, uh, she uh, uh, did her PhD on some of these complex systems that looking at how effed up the data is and how not transparent it's done and how the state data or um, certain data privileges only the people who have uh, the resources to data mine it and munge it, clean it up, and effectively um, weaponize it in the sense of commercialize it. Um, so we're focused here on uh, this conversation on New York City because these are the things that we feel that we have the levers of power to pull. But state data is a huge conversation that um, too few people actually work with. And so I'd like to see that data. Um, and we have to convince state agencies to release that data. Does that answer the question? I mean, part of it, but it, I mean, it's a huge, it's a big question. <laughs> what can cities and civic hackers do to work with Socrata to help them improve their offerings? And what are like the costs and benefits of one company having kind of being the front end of so many cities open data? <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there is a software provider called Socrata. They have the market share or lion's share of municipal and state, municipal state uh, data portals. Um, they um, have an all-inclusive tool um, that enables you to take a number of data sets and you put it up there regardless of the format. And um, if it's in tabular format, you have um, kind of Excel-like functions. Uh, there's also a whole suite of tools that are in there that allow for mapping functions. Um, it's a very lucrative and sexy tool for municipalities to purchase and deploy because it has all of the, they can claim and check off all of these little boxes uh, around usability, like that. Um, you have the, the, the Socrata tool. If you have good data that's going into it, you can do a thousand things within that Socrata data tool. And it's all within the browser. So that's great. Um, how do you challenge that dominance? Uh, I'm trying to look at you directly, Adam. Um, how do you challenge the dominance and get cities to use different platforms? Uh, huh? Uh, 
I mean, ultimately, it's about investing in other platforms um, to, uh, to get other platforms to have more features. Um, and I think that that's, and, and working, I, my aspiration is open tools that uh, are, allow for flexibility and allow for growth and that allow for collaboration. Um, there are very few data platforms that are completely open source and, and that offer the same type of um, utility. Uh, but it's difficult for me to stand up here and challenge the dominance of Socrata for the fact that any one of you with a large enough screen and a fast enough internet connection can do data analysis, municipal data analysis like that. Um, and it, it, that's the cost benefit analysis right there is that usability and that's what tugs at my heart because I would love to see an open data system but to get that it requires investment. And that can happen, it's just coordinated investment. Hi, um, I'm hoping that you could just talk for a little bit more about the use cases of this. I'm thinking a little bit about what you're saying about the community boards and their low digital literacy and um, their desire to have those 311 reports back and what it gets us to have to give them the access and the tools to crunch the open data rather than, I'm just sort of imagining a case of 51 community boards all sort of duplicating the same work, not great, and not all according to the same sort of standards or parameters, and when we just want to give people their canned reports back if that's what they choose. Um, or just so about like figuring out that balance between what is ideal and what is just distributed headbanging. So each community board has a certain level of autonomy to kind of like, and they deal with different types of issues. Uh, what we did um, as part of the fellowship program discovered that like um, CB5 Midtown had a disproportionate number of um, three one service requests around receipts from muni meters. Uh, and it was really weird because it was like, how in the heck, like, what? Like, muni meter receipts. Why is this your number one 311 uh, 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 request? Shouldn't it be like noise or shouldn't it be potholes? Uh, you know, should it be something that, that um, and, and in, in general, all the Manhattan community boards had similar uh, service request issues, but you get these little anomalies. You, ha you have Sandy, where all of a sudden heat and hot water complaints um, uh, spike in the Lower East Side um, in, in 2013, and then so that becomes a blip on the data, kind of like your data analysis. Um, so the tools need to be flexible, and they need to be... It, <laughs> that means we're almost directly out of time. Um, so um, things need to be flexible enough that uh, allow for for those needs that are really, really dispersed and, and, and different. Um, so this is all like user research that we've done so far. Um, now maybe there's a market opportunity for someone to develop that solution so that way through one, so that way community boards can just get the reports that they need. Um, but it's hard because every community board is a little bit different. Uh, it's run a little bit differently. They're organized the same way. Within the 12 Manhattan community boards, and Lucian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard Aldrin say this, like each one has their, uh, their own specific set of bylaws. And so each community board organizes themselves a little bit differently based upon the community need. Um, and how do we start building tools that essentially kind of mirror that um, is kind of the civic hacker question. How do, we, how do we do that and how do we, yeah, how do we architect that? Oh, there, can we do one more? Sure. Or two <laughs> do more. You want to there's one, Greg. One more. <laughs> there's, um, yeah, Greg. Um, so you've been in a leadership position for quite a few years, especially in the Beta NYC uh, 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 brigade or or sort of association. And um, the question of sustainability seems to be reaching a fever pitch um, in these scenes. Uh, 
question of how to actually sustain essentially very hard work that isn't really like something that can just come out of a hackathon and solve problems. What have you learned about um, the potential for uh, actually going even deeper on some of these hard problems in a way that's actually open and participatory and sustainable? So I'm going to take that one, and then I wanted to take the other question over here and see if I can answer two of them at the same time. Um, actually, mine was just a comment that um, like, I think it's just really wonderful how your work is sort of setting the foundation for so many different topics that we all are interested in this, in this room, um, whether it's housing or transportation or, um, or other things, tree, uh, trees, um, parks, et cetera. And um, you know, we need people who are looking at this in the broadest way, in addition to those people who get into specific topics you know, and drive into them. So it's just so important that we have people like you doing this kind of thing. So thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and and as a co-leader of Beta NYC, thank you. Um, uh, and I hope I hope that this that this research and I'm you know I want to go back to the very first thing. I've been privileged to um, set up a series of things that all benefit each other. Um, to explore these different ideas and taking a limited amount of resources, um, gluing them together to allow for um, a trajectory um, uh, and an infrastructure to, to explore. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, it's been difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's been based on human relationships. And frankly, I'm at the point where um, uh, I need more money to do this. Uh, Beta NYC needs to hire two to three people to really execute the Civic Innovation Fellows program based upon the research that we have. Um, um, most funders uh, see New York as an anomaly that New York should be self-sufficient, and so um, it's been hard to get money uh, to, to work on these programs. I'm really, really thankful for DNS for supporting these activities last year um, as kind of an opportunity to explore this stuff. It's given me the foundation and the ammo to, to, to now apl um, apply to other programs. Um, there's another program that I'll be able to, I, ha I will have a larger program in the fall to talk about these ideas. I can't announce it just yet, but it comes with no money. But it's a larger, like it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a larger venue to talk about these issues at a national level. Um, and that's great, but it doesn't come with a paycheck or a stipend in the same way that the work and the activity that I did here did. And so um, that's a frustrating thing because how, how, how do we sustain this? And you know, Greg is also implying a much broader conversation. So if you're outside of New York City, there are a number of other communities that are part of a larger ecosystem through the Code for America Brigade or the Code for All program. They're all questioning how do they uh, do these types of this type of activity, which is needed activity. Um, you know, I'm, I, now that I have research, I can go to city council and say, hey, you know, please like, help fund one of these programs, but I have to kind of play within that vein. Um, we're, we have the infrastructure now through this year, Beta NYC, we, Beta NYC, uh, moved from one fiscal sponsor to the Fund for the City of New York, so we can now do programs like we did with the Trees Count and the Parks Department, where we got paid to do that type of research and to put on that type of activity. You know, our collaboration with Manhattan Borough President's Office uh, unlocked uh, grants so that way we can, we can explore that stuff. But it ain't easy. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can just continue embracing open and sharing so that way one of you and one of you uh, builds a tool that makes a shitload of money, and they are so nice and generous that they want to continue funding uh, uh, our, our research. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, the, my other fear is that we do somewhat of this work, and then we weaponize it, and we fall into a trap where we've only empowered a very few people because that information stays at the top. And so I have this bigger fear, and I want to stay open. Somebody criticized me for being scrappy, and I said, I'm like, 
I, I'm happy to stay scrappy. Um, I'm also would like to have a savings account again and uh, maybe have a child someday and be able to pay for their education. So um, with that, uh, I want to say thank you, all of you, for coming out today. And thank you, Noel. Thank Aww. you. Thank you for um, reminding us. Thank you for your enthusiasm and passion and fun that you bring to this topic at Data and Society. I feel like you're our mascot here this year. Uh, and uh, it's a great reminder that of the, the tool that data can be to bring people together and to uh, empower people. So thank you. Thank and you. We're going to miss you. Come back. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay as, a, as an affiliate yes. um, next year. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are ever interested in the Data and Society Fellowship Program, I'm more than happy to talk about what I've learned. I've really, really enjoyed this. So thank you, DNSF. I can't say that uh, enough. Um, explore applying for a fellowship next year or get a job. There's a program administrator position <laughs> that's available. Uh, come work here. Come more, back to Data Bytes. Um, uh, come to Whiskey Wednesdays, uh, be part of the family here. This is a great community. So thank you for the opportunity to be thank part you. of it. Thank you. And with that note, I'm going to ask everyone, we're going to turn this back into a workspace. So if you wouldn't mind throwing away all of your plates and cups and helping us to stack the chairs on your way out while you meet new friends. Thank you so much for coming out on a hot day.